The podcast universe has exploded with amazing content for everyone to listen to. And there are so many incredible shows with just not enough time to listen to all of them. So if you're asking yourself, what do I listen to? The answer is real simple. Thrive Loud is the must-listen-to, can't-miss-an-episode, gotta-hear-what's-next, most fun, energizing, and inspiring podcast show you'll ever encounter. With hundreds of episodes of guests ranging from CEOs, entrepreneurs, innovators, thought leaders, inspiring speakers to amazing humans, Thrive Loud is the real deal. Listen in as Lou Diamond decodes what makes incredible people thrive. If you're a regular listener, you already know this. And if this is your first time listening, get ready to thrive loud with Lou Diamond. Welcome everyone to another episode of Thrive Loud with Lou Diamond, connecting you to the most inspiring and amazing people that are thriving each and every day. I'm your host, Lou Diamond. Today on Thrive Loud, we have an expert in the field of troubled and distressed companies. He is a strategic advisor to investment institutions and corporate management. He is also the author of Death March Escape, the remarkable story of a man who twice escaped the Nazi Holocaust. Thrive Loud listeners, Jack Hirsch. Jack, welcome to Thrive Loud. Thanks for having me, Lou. So this is an interesting conversation that we're going to kick off. People heard what you do for a living, but obviously you have a crazy story that I would love you to share with the listeners because not only did you write a book about a man, but you have a very close connection. Can you share with the listeners a little about what this book is about and we'll dive more into it? Sure. So my father um, was a Hungarian um, Jew in World War II and uh, at the age of 18 years old was sent off to a concentration camp, initially Auschwitz and then later uh, the worst rated camp in the right called Mudhausen. Uh, he spent about a year there and at the end of the war, um, all the Jews in the camp were death marched, force marched out of the camp and my father escaped. He was recaptured not killed incredibly um, and inexplicably. Um, he was put on another march a week later and he escaped again. And this time a local family found him and hit him for three weeks until the Americans came through and rescued him. And that's what the book is about. Jack, how old was he when he, when this happened and when he was escaping? Both the first he was time 18 and time. when he was sent into the camps and he was 19 when he, when he had his, when he did his two escapes. So obviously eventually he not only escaped from there, um, eventually he made it to the United States, because I know that you, you're from, from New York. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. He spent a year and a half in a hospital after the war, recovering. He weighed 80. He's a 160-pound man who weighed 80 pounds when he escaped. Um, wow. He spent a year and a half in the hospital. Uh, going to, he had peritonitis. He had typhus. He had tuberculosis. Uh, he, had, he, he, he weighed 80 pounds. He had a get that back. He spent a year and a half back in his hometown afterward, and then he went to Israel for 10 years. I was born at that 10th year, uh, and then it was 1958, and then uh, we came to America a year later. I'd love to know this story. Was this a story that you knew growing up, or was this something that you learned maybe later in life? That's a great question. Um, so my father told the story every Passover. You know, Passover is the story of the Jews leaving Egypt or escaping from Egypt some 3,000 years ago. My father would always digress in the middle of the meal, um, the Seder meal on, the, on Passover evening, to tell his story of the survival and escape from concentration camp. Or as I would, I, I, I'm well aware that a great many survivors don't tell their stories. But as I would tell people, you know, if you escaped twice from the Nazis, you'd be telling people. My father was that guy. He, he liked to tell it. Maybe it was cathartic. So I knew it my whole life. But what I didn't know, it turns out, was the real details. I mean, he told the story in an, in an entertaining way. Now, it's certainly an interesting story, but I wouldn't call it entertaining. I was spending a year in a concentration camp, yet that's how he presented it. And then in 2007, I discovered that his photo is on the concentration camp's website. A, I didn't know the concentration camp had a website in 2007. And B, it was a photo I don't have. So I reached out to them and asked them, A, how do you know his story? And B, how'd you get this photograph? And I suddenly discovered that he was something of a hero to them because of the local family that had hidden him for three weeks. You know, it was, a, it was a, the one feel-good story these guys had. And one thing led to another, and I suddenly discovered that you know, the story he told me, while completely true, left out a lot of significant and 
horrific detail, which I subsequently learned over a few years of doing research and then put that in a book. How um, your father obviously lived till how, how many years did your did how many years did it take for you to realize that this was a story that you wanted to tell everybody? Because that's actually you've been hearing in your whole life. Yeah, what you know, inspired writing it? So I started the the. the what started me learning about the concentration camp, knowing the story, was 2007. It wasn't until 2015 that I began to put paper to pencil, pen to paper. And the reason for it is, you know, it's a story I knew my whole life. It just it, it seemed kind of ordinary, as hard as that may be to believe, but it, it just didn't seem exceptional. And then one day I was at a dinner, a business dinner, uh, I think it was like late 2014. Um, it was in Chicago, a number of business guys. And somehow my father's story came up, or maybe we were talking World War II or whatever it was, the story came up and I told it. And the next day, one of the guys at dinner called me and said, you know, I've never met a survivor. I've never met anyone that I've known to be related to a survivor. I've never heard of a story like that in my life. And it's changed my life. Suddenly nothing will be as hard or as difficult as it will, as it ever had been before. Um, if he could go through what he went through, I could handle the things that I have to handle. And I decided to myself, if that was true of this guy, it's gotta be true of thousands of people, hundreds of thousands of people. I need to put this on paper. And I started to. Jack, this is interesting. Um, I guess you made a great point. This is a story you've been hearing your whole life and you may have assumed that it wasn't remarkable because it is, by the way, the fact that anyone survives, uh, that particular time era and to have escaped two particular camps is unbelievable. Um, I guess I want to know a little bit more about the relationship between your father and you. And that is, do you think these efforts of overcoming things, are there certain things about survival or certain instincts that you've known about that story that maybe you've possessed throughout your life? Talk about your relationship with your dad and maybe who he was as a man after, obviously, this window, and how it's affected you growing up. Well, that, that takes me down to what the other part of the book is about. The book has two stories. The first story is my dad's, and interwoven within it is the story of my discovery of all these things about his experience in the concentration camp and his two escapes that I didn't know. And then woven within that is an attempt to understand why I am the way we are, you know, and, and, and to expand on the book's sort of mission, you know, irrespective of who our parents were, whether they were CEOs or um, call center operators or homemakers or whatever it is our parents did, they impact who we were, who we are, how, who, how we become who we are. And in working on my father's story, I suddenly began to realize that the things that I do and the person that I am, um, I, I have a litany of things that I that I do. I, I know people who do one or two of them. I, I fly planes and I jump out of them, and I and I'm an expert skier and I'm a martial artist and I teach. I'm a black belt and I teach and um, uh, I play hockey. I, I mean, I could, it's a list. And I know, as I said, people who do a few of them. Not anybody who does all of them. And I finally began to realize I think I do all these things because I'm trying to somehow equal the man he was. We had a great relationship. Mm. Um, he was an incredibly understanding father. I think he got mad at me a few times that I could ever remember. Um, this was back in the days of corporal punishment was okay. 50, 60 years ago, he hit me once. <laughs> um, basically, his view of the world was if you do something wrong and you admit it and you say you're sorry, you're good to go. But if you don't, you're not good to go. And so, and, and he, he dealt that way with other people too. You know, hurt me once, but then apologize to me and you're okay. Um, and it was a lesson that I, I still carry with me today, but so he was an incredibly gentle, kind, funny, interesting, entertaining man. And I think I got some of the genetics of that entertainment part, maybe in, in my ability to have written this book, cause I'm an engineer. I never really took a writing course and I got a book out that's got some, gotten some great reviews, but, um, who I am was very much dictated by the impossible thing he did. I mean, I'm, I think what I've done is I've spent 56, 50 odd years. I mean, the years since I was an infant um, trying to match him, which of course is impossible. Well, I mean, and you're writing your own remarkable story, I guess, in your life and you have a great role model to, to go with. Um, how, how long did he, um, when did he pass? I, I lost him in 2001. He was 76 years old. I guess I want to know, in writing this story for yourself, I, I, I've inter I interview a lot of authors, Jack, 
Um, we have a show, Authors of Thrive, and we feature about the, the writing process and we talk about, you know, what inspired them to this. This is obviously simple. It's a story you've been hearing your entire life. But um, what I would love to know is what is the way that you wrote this process? Was it as simple, you just jotted it all down or you did it as a research piece? Tell me how you put that together. Well, it, it, that last part of your question was, was probably most telling. So for a living, uh, I've, I've been doing research uh, on companies that are in trouble and I would occasionally write about them. And then I had investors that I would write to. So I was, I was accustomed to writing. Um, when I decided to write the story, I initially believed the story of my dad's survival and escape was the story. And so I wrote that. And then it was only part of the way through that, that I suddenly realized, no, wait a minute, there's other, this, this entire other story of me discovering all the things about him, where he escaped the first time, where he escaped the second time, where he was hidden, walking in the house, walking into the fields and walking the death march routes, walking the concentration camp and describing all that. So when I got done with the first story, I then interwove this second story. And I, I know there's this cliche, it writes itself. I, it, it doesn't write itself. And it, 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 or you, I could certainly tell you on the nights and weekends I spent writing and I wasn't, it wasn't my pen, my hand wasn't working without control. Um, but it, it, the, because the story was so clear in my mind, it wasn't hard to get it on paper. And maybe also, as I said, because I've sort of, I've written research for a living, this, this wasn't that distinct from that. And, and, and I guess that was uh, where I would lead to this. Um, you obviously, when telling the story, had heard how remarkable it was. Now that the book has been out and people have given feedback about it, talk about how it's felt to have that finished product out there to, you know, to basically put in print what really meant so much to you throughout your life. Well, I guess the, the most important thing for me was getting a story out that would keep people remembering what happened not just to the Jews in World War II, but to, uh, to it was the communists and the gays and um, the intelligentsia. And it was Russian prisoners. It was, it was the disabled. It was, it was the, the, the Nazis killed anyone they didn't think fit the Aryan mold. And it's, it's a story we can't forget. And so when I began to realize that people were reading the book and enjoying the book and remembering what was in the book, I realized now that I, there, here's a vehicle to help people be sure that they aren't going to ever forget. Um, and I, you know, I took a lot of satisfaction from that. There's, there's, there's probably no other way to describe it. Um, I enjoy, I was about to say, I enjoy telling the story. I'm asked to speak every few weeks somewhere about the book and, and my father's story and enjoy is not quite the right word. It's a, it's a, it's a mission I feel that I'm on. Um, and there's great satisfaction in knowing that I've gotten the story across in a way that has people remember it and has people recognize the lessons from it. Jack, having people remember the story is important, and that's amazing what you're doing. You're, you're, you're successful in what you do in your career as a strategic advisor. You, you do all those things that you mentioned, playing all these sports and activities and things that you do, these remarkable things that are out there, which means you're thriving often. But sometimes we're not kicking on all cylinders. On the days you're having trouble thriving, who or what practice do you seek to get yourself back on the thriving track? Well, this goes back to my father. My father lived by these phrases. I, I, it might be because English wasn't his first language, although he spoke nine languages. He, he just, he had these, uh, and I guess cliches are probably the right word, but one of them that never, ever left me, or two of them, I guess, really were one, it's not so terrible. And two, it beats the alternative. So, you know, I, I gashed my hand one day on a windowsill and no such thing as, as um, the stitches. My dad just sort of wrapped it up in a bandage and, and he said, don't, you know, it'll stop bleeding soon enough. And he also said, eh, it's not so terrible. And no matter how bad things were, I lost my mother when she was 13 years old. She was sick for most of my life. And my dad lived with that and, and buried her. And he would still say it beats the alternative. No matter how bad things are, no matter how rough things might be at that one particular moment in your life. It beats the alternative. It beats not being here. Uh, you know, um, he used to tell a story that right after he came over to this country, he was working as a busboy. He was a 38 or 39 year old busboy at the time. I'm sorry, 33 year old busboy at the time. And he remembers somebody saying to him one day, one of his customers uh, in, a, in a restaurant, why the long face? My father said, well, my son's in the hospital. I'd severely burned my arm when I was a year old. Um, my wife's in the hospital. She's having open heart surgery. Um, and I'm a busboy at 33 years old. And the guy said, you know what? 
There's 2 billion people who trade places with you in a heartbeat, so stop. And it was that kind of thing about my father and, and the way he, he looked at the world that I dig down into when things get tough. That is a great perspective and something I think that now connects everybody here to you and, and why you wrote this. Let's do that right now. Let's do the admin part of the show here, Jack. Share with everybody where they can find the book, where they can learn more about you and any other projects you have coming up down the road on what's next. Project. Sure. Well, so the book's available in Barnes & Noble. It's on Amazon. It's probably the easiest place to get it, I would suppose. But bookstores do carry it. Um, there's a website. It's deathmarchescape, all one word, dot com, deathmarchescape.com. And, and in there, there's a link to a website, davidhirsch.com. And Hirsch is H-E-R-S-C-H, same mine and my father's both. Um, and that will give you much more of the story of my dad, um, a little bit of the writing of the book, a little bit about me. Um, and then as far as other projects go, um, well, we're reaching me. You can also reach me through deathmarchescape.com. And as far as other projects go, I'm actually nearly done with, uh, a book about, um, the dangers of aviation automation, things like the Boeing 737 crashes that yeah. automation, you can point to automation as the cause that I think a lot of people haven't even realized the, the, the decline in the in the skill sets of pilots because of automation, those sorts of things. And, and uh, I've got a book about that coming out probably at the end of the year. Interesting, right? You've got such a, a breadth of, of different experiences, things that you do, and it makes total sense. I mean, talking about this personal story, obviously, about Nazis, but also this other thing that's affecting all of us because you must have such a wide range of things that you're involved with, that you care about, that you know about. You'd be a good lifeline on some trivia show, I'm sure, <laughs> um, with all the research and work that you do. Jack, let's do this. Let's go what I call down Fun Street here. We like to talk a little bit about the things that you know make people thrive and what de- we're trying to decode it. And sometimes learning about the fun things they do also helps with it. Uh, do you have a favorite movie of all time? I do. It's Gladiator. Okay. And why does that movie connect with you? I think because, well, the, the catchphrase, and I don't remember it exactly anymore, but it's something like a general who became um, a slave, who became the, the freer of his people or something like that. He's a man who had everything, and then everything was taken away from him. And he continued to thrive. He continued to live. He continued to function as a leader or eventually went from slave to being recognized as a leader among slaves. He never let himself not be who he was. Um, I think it's a great story told in a great way. I think Russell Crowe is fantastic in it. Um, the, it's, it just always resonated with me. Maybe it reminds me of my dad a little bit. Yeah. It's also that just on my own personal note here and connecting to it, it was uh, the movie I saw the night my child was born. So it was, oh, <laughs> wow. so, so we, almost named him, we almost named him Maximus, but we held back. It would, it would have been yeah. a little bit long. That way. Uh, any music that you use when you're trying to get yourself pumped up or focused or whatever it is, certain songs that you like to hear? You know, I'm, I'm more of a classic rock guy, honestly. Um, and there's no one song more than another that necessarily resonates. Um, I, I like the Doors and I like the Stones and some of the harder rock Beatles, but they, I, I'm pretty eclectic. Uh, with, within that narrow genre, I'm, I, I, I don't have a preference. Last thing here, Jack, you've got all those activities that you do, which I still give you credit that you're still doing hockey and all these different sports that are out there. In fact, through that is how the connection of how we got you on this program. You get to pick one of those activities to do as like the the number one favorite activity or distraction or physical thing you like to do. Ski, this, that, whatever it is. What is it? The go-to activity you want to do. I I, I'm going to, I'm going to ask for two. And the first is hockey. Um, if you play, you know, I don't have to go any further. If you don't play, there is nothing like I was it. A, I was a goal. I, I was a goalie. <laughs> oh, you were a goalie. Go, go goalie. I like, I like putting myself, I like putting myself in front of fa- fast moving. But, but you get it. You're a skater. Um, I think if you skate, there was something freeing about skating. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm an expert skier and, um, I played hockey as a kid and, um, there was a long period of time where I didn't play and, and skiing was sort of my number one thing. And then as I picked up hockey again and I play it a few times a week, um, my, my ski Jones has kind of dropped a little bit for that reason. But the second thing is I think flying. Um, I love to fly airplanes. I fly aerobatics when I can. Um, that too is freeing. Your, your, your life is in your hands. You, you mess up you die. Um, you just, you don't mess up. And if something goes wrong, you solve it or you die. So you just, so you solve it. Um, having that, 
pressure on you, but at the same time, having that three-dimensional freedom is just, I think, uh, it's great. I, I, don't have a, I, don't have, I don't have a better word than great. Jack Hirsch, a remarkable man in his own right, inspirational, living each and every day. Thanks for coming on Thrive Loud. A pleasure to have you on. Thanks for having me, Lou. And to all our listeners out there, thank you for joining us. And until next time, keep thriving onward and upward. And remember, be brief, be bright, and be gone. Try to run, try to hide. Wake up. You've been listening to Thrive Loud with your host, Lou Diamond. Make sure to subscribe on iTunes, Overcast, or wherever you get your podcasts. And follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at Thrive Loud. Or find us on the web at thriveloud.com.